Get towards me here, please. Ladies and gentlemen, as a university librarian, I am delighted to welcome everyone on this very special day. The day on which we mark the formal naming of the Milstein Exhibition Center and Seminar Rooms. I'm particularly pleased to welcome the Milstein family, Mr. Howard Milstein, Mrs. Abby Milstein, and Mr. Michael Milstein. I would also like to express a warm welcome to Dr. Georgette Benish and to the guests of the Milstein family. The Milstein's generous gift is of immense value to the University Library, as it will facilitate the sharing of the library's cultural and educational resources, not just with the Cambridge academic community and visitors to the library, but with the world through our online exhibitions. The user is at the heart of this library, and this funding allows us to further embrace our global role. The new exhibition web space will create the opportunity for the library to offer innovative ways in which to interpret our exhibitions. Potentially, any book, manuscript, map, or photograph can become part of a virtual exhibition, and the library will now be able to, draw, uh, to build a rich gallery of images to do justice to our extraordinary collections. More importantly, it will allow use of our cultural and educational resources by anyone with internet access. It will not be a static initiative, so I do hope you will all watch this space. Even in the digital age, the physical rare book or manuscript still has huge potency and is a special attraction. It is important to remember the wide appeal of seeing these treasures up close and in person. Thanks to the generosity of the Milsteins, we've been able to extend our exhibition space beyond the exhibition center itself into the library's entrance hall with two new exhibition cases to give more prominence and visibility to our collections and to draw people into the Milstein exhibition center. This is a very happy day for the university library and staff. On behalf of us all, I would like to express sincere thanks to the Howard and Abby Milstein Foundation. <laughs> Mr. Michael Milstein and Mr. Howard Milstein have both agreed to say a few words. And we will then have the unveiling of the naming plaque, which has been designed and cut by Lida Kindersley of the Cardoso Kindersley Workshop. But before we hear from the Milsteins, the Vice Chancellor has kindly agreed to say a few words. Thank you. Mr. and Mrs. Milstein, it's a great privilege and pleasure to be here today. You know, we all have introductions to libraries and at different times in our lives we view libraries differently. As a student, it was almost a place of purgatory. Uh, you had to suffer it for long, prolonged periods of time. You had to get your work done, essays written, and all the rest of it. And you usually try to get out as quickly as possible, uh, usually for interminable cups of coffee. That's one view of the library. Second view of the library was for me in 1988 here in Cambridge. You walk in, I then joined as a new lecturer in medicine here in Cambridge. You walk in through the main door to be greeted by, and who are you? <laughs> <laughs> yes, valuable collections need to be protected, and they were right to challenge me. But it wasn't the sort of greeting that I hope that uh, anybody would experience here today. And then my third incarnation of the library, my first visit to the university at library, was with the then chancellor, the Duke of Edinburgh. 
Now, on that occasion, the university library laid on an exhibition for the Duke of Edinburgh to celebrate his chancellorship and particularly the chancellors of old of this uh, established university, 800 years. The Duke of Edinburgh called me over come here, Boris, you want to see this particular manuscript. And it is the one book that I really must treasure in this library. It had a wonderful plate. And a description of the plate was the aldermen and burghers of Cambridge paying homage to the vice chancellor of the university. <laughs> so such traditions have to be long enshrined. And I can now see the importance of why libraries must retain the record uh, for all time. <laughs> I can dream on to actually think that that would ever happen again. But these are the facets of the library. A working library to enable students, academics and staff to develop their themes. A library which actually enables professionals to make sure that they remain on track. And thirdly, a repository of knowledge which is at the foundation of what universities are about. And it is that knowledge that is so important. So this exhibition centre and seminar rooms enables the library to, to reach out and together with the virtual space and together with the programmes of digitisation that in particular we've embarked on here with Anne's leadership, it's absolutely vital that this work continues. Because as a library, we want to share this knowledge with anyone in the world who is interested. That is the importance of knowledge. It is there to be shared and for people to glean new knowledge from the knowledge uh, of the past. So on behalf of the university, my thanks for your prescience, your support, and for ensuring that the hard work that Anne and colleagues here in the library have embarked on is being supported, and visibly so, to all of the community of the university, but maybe much more important to the wider community of the world. Thank you very much indeed, sir. <laughs> Now, Mr. Michael Milstein. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Anne. Thank you, Vice Chancellor. Um, it is an absolute treat to be back here. Uh, I spent six very happy months as a student at Pembroke, and amongst somehow the many wonderful, wonderful memories I have, I've managed to shut out the terrible hay fever I get this time of year. So, um, so hopefully that doesn't erupt as I'm, as I'm trying to convey some serious emotion. Um, we just were lucky enough to spend some time upstairs looking at some of the treasures of this library and to see the look on my mother's face, who is a true lover of books, was as fulfilling for me as anything I've ever, I've ever witnessed. Um, about two or three weeks ago, we were at an event um, at the New York Public Library honoring my mother and my father um, for the work my mother has done there. And certainly this institution is one of kindred spirit and of like cause. And um, to be able to come over here and support the works of this library is something that is special to our entire family. Um, my mother gave a speech, a really lovely speech, um, describing how her love of books grew as a child in Pittsburgh. And my love of books grew a little bit later. I was a student here at Cambridge. And one thing about being a student here at Cambridge is that you're given a list of recommended books and set free. And you take to the library and you open those books and you learn. And if you're fortunate enough, you have a supervisor who is able to help you navigate that process of learning. I was lucky enough to have Dr. Peter Martland, um, who taught me in British social and economic history. And then when a tragedy that I don't want to be here without mentioning occurred, the death of Dr. Emil peroso Sien, who, uh, who was a wonderful man and supposed to be my supervisor for the second trimester I was here. Um, who, in his own way, you know, I showed up for one supervision. And one of the wonderful things about the study abroad scheme is that they, they want to accommodate you and give you the opportunity to learn that which will serve you best. And I came and I said to him, you know, I, I think he said, what do you want to learn? I said, I'd love to learn about the, the origins of, of, you know, both Marxism and and. Adam Smith. I'm, I'm really interested in those two things, and they would play wonderfully into, 
and to what I'm studying back home. He said, so why don't we do a course for you called the intellectual genesis of capitalism and socialism? And that happened, you know, he didn't even have to think about it. And, and it's that sort of thought uh, that is part of the customized education here that I thought complemented my learning in, at Cornell University in the United States so, so well. Um, so that process by which I opened books, I interacted with books, really made an impact on me. Um, and when you couple that with all the friends I made here and uh, obviously the social aspect of Cambridge, I was fortunate to, uh, to be welcomed onto the University Golf Club, which was an absolutely wonderful experience. <laughs> or as I told my parents, in actuality, it was the University Drinking Club. Um, that's the way things happen. They, they learn to accept it. Um, but um, I'd say... It, it was a wonderful time in my life. Um, Pembroke College became a true home to me. Um, you know, Sir Richard Dearlove, the master of our college, has done tremendous things for the college. Um, Dr. Alan Dawson, who runs the international study scheme, um, has really made that, I think, into a gem of a program and one which I hold very, very dear to my heart. Um, and I think it, it wouldn't be appropriate to leave this event without mentioning Pat Ask, who, our, our own college librarian, um, who took me. Pat, Pat is back there. I see her waving her hand. I haven't had the opportunity to say hello yet. She brought me downstairs to view some of the early editions of Malthus, as Dr. Martland had me writing um, the paper on the question of, was Malthus right or was he wrong? which if any of you want my very opinionated views on that, I'd be happy to share. <laughs> um, and uh, most important for me to thank today are my parents, who in addition to giving me the support, the confidence, and, and the opportunity to do everything, you know, from this point forward, I have the opportunity to do in life, um, also have been supportive of my love of Cambridge and have, uh, have been able to support this library and bring me back here today. So I want to thank them and introduce my father. Thanks, guys. Well, I'm sure you can all see why I'm so proud of this young man <laughs> and why Dr. Peter Martland is proud as well. Uh, let me first acknowledge some of the people here. Uh, certainly, I want to acknowledge Sir Richard Dearlove, the master of Pembroke College. I'm not sure he's in the room, but uh, I'll be seeing him later. Of course, uh, in addition to the vice chancellor, whose very kind words were deeply appreciated, I want to recognize Ann Jarvis uh, in charge of all this. And Ann and I have met a number of times over the last year or so. And uh, she brings me lovely gifts. <laughs> so I'm happy to return the favor. Uh, we now actually, uh, and I do want to also mention uh, Professor Simon Franklin. Uh, is Professor Franklin here? Yeah. He's the head of the Faculty of uh, the Arts and Humanities. In uh, America, we call it Arts and Sciences because it's got a broader, it's a more specialized focus here, uh, which is... Uh, something we might bring back to the States. So some of you are probably wondering, what is an American doing here supporting our magnificent uh, institution of Cambridge University? And uh, I guess I'll just take a moment to uh, tell you a little of my own history, which is I went to Cornell University and I got two degrees from Harvard and my wife got two degrees from Harvard. Uh, John Harvard, of course, uh, exported his library to Harvard University uh, about 400 years ago, which became uh, the basis of, of Harvard University. But I started my career at uh, a firm called Warburg Paribas Becker, a partnership with the firm of S.G. Warburgs. Uh, and uh, I spent my first several years going back and forth between the U.S. and the U.K. And I became, uh, in addition to the travels I had earlier in my life, an Anglophile of some sort and uh, very interested in things British. And uh, as things developed uh, over the years, we became involved with uh, Prince Philip's World Fellowship. Uh, I became the president of a foundation uh, in London, uh, and we gave out the Milstein Medal for six years uh, at the Royal Acad Academy of Music 
uh, in piano. And uh, then when my son uh, got to the point of thinking about studying abroad, my wife and I uh, urged him to consider coming to Oxbridge. Uh, and he selected Cambridge. He uh, very made the wise decision. Uh, and uh, so he had a wonderful time here. Uh, he grew as a person. He grew intellectually. Uh, he grew socially. Uh, enjoyed the golf team, as he mentioned. And uh, the Stymies that year uh, did win over Oxford. Uh, and so all in all, couldn't have been better. And so we started to think about some other involvement here with Cambridge. Uh, and uh, I met Anne, and the rest of this is, is history. So anyway, I thought I would just say one thing uh, of a list. I had made a list of things I thought I would talk about today, and they were the following. Don't worry, I'll cut this short. Uh, of course, we stand on the shoulders of giants. We know about Sir Isaac Newton and everything that goes with that. Your supervision, uh, your supervisory method, or elsewhere called uh, the tutorial method versus uh, American education and the internet, and the strength of your model. Uh, our biological versus our intellectual forebearers, the mother tongue and the Western canon, we are what we know, the learning animal and consideration in my son's education, which started Greek and Latin history when he was quite young, which I ended up learning much more about it than he did. Uh, responsibilities of institutions uh, of excellence and individuals. Confidence can only come from knowledge. What can we do? What should we do? Chance favors the prepared mind. And we shape our buildings, and there thereafter they shape us. That's Churchill's famous quote. But I'll simply reduce all that to uh, one thought, which is each of us is an inheritor uh, of a uh, tradition. In my own case, uh, my grandfather came to the United States from Russia. Uh, he uh, emigrated uh, when he was a child. Uh, and uh, my, he became a successful businessman and was always quite charitable and philanthropic. He believed in supporting institutions of excellence with great leaders and great leadership. My father continued that tradition and took uh, our family business to uh, tremendous success that he never imagined would occur. And uh, I've tried to continue in that vein. But I also uh, am the inheritor, and after me, and Michael is inheritor of this tradition, but after Alongside that, I'm the inheritor of an intellectual tradition that comes from my professors and my mentors over the years. Uh, they come from George P. Adams, Jr., who taught me at Cornell in the history of economics. And they come from people like Bernard Knox, who I studied uh, and spoke with once over the phone, who's one of the great uh, uh, Greek classicists uh, who passed away recently. Uh, so we have, each of us are inheritors of a great tradition. I like to trace myself back through people like Paul Freund, who I instructed me in constitutional law, uh, back to Sir Oliver, to Oliver Wendell Holmes, Justice Holmes. But that takes us back to the 1850s. Here at Cambridge, we go all the way back, uh, practically back to the caveman <laughs> in American terms. Uh, so an 800 year history is one that we are proud to be associated with. We're delighted with what Michael has learned, and we're delighted to have, be, have this permanent association with the University Library. Thank you. Now, I, I would like to call upon Mr. Howard Milstein and Mrs. Abby Milstein to unveil our naming plaque.